The word of God is powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, divided in the sun of the soul and the spirit and the joints of the marrow, and is a critic of false and intense of the heart. All scripture is God's breath and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped and furnished for every good work. Study to show yourself approved unto God a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing or rightly handling the word of truth. If you will, open the word of truth to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8. We're continuing our study of 1 Timothy. Paul is the author of 1 Timothy, and he's writing to a young pastor by the name of Timothy. And here, Paul is uh, given, in chapter 3, qualifications for the leaders in the local church. These qualifications is not just qualifications that should be reflected in the pastor, elder, and the deacon's life, but I think that every believer should be spirit controlled because these qualifications in the life of the pastor, elder, and the deacon shows that these uh, uh, leaders are controlled and influenced by the Holy Spirit would apply to every believer in Jesus Christ. He may be given qualification uh, for elders and pastors and deacons, but uh, every believer is called to be spirit controlled. And, and, and so especially the pastor and the deacon. So don't see uh, uh, this chapter as just applying to pastor, the elders, and deacon. See this as Paul showing us to have order uh, in the church. We must be spirit filled. Can you imagine what the Lord can accomplish through this church if most believers in the church is controlled by the Holy Spirit? <laughs> you will see the book of Acts relived <laughs> and so that is what should set us apart is we all are striving to learn how to have an intimate and close relationship with the holy spirit where he control and influence everything that we think everything we do everything we say in life and so a leader need to be spirit controlled a leader in a local assembly need to be spirit control in order for us to leave a historical impact in our community and the world, we must always be spirit control. And when we're spirit control, it's gonna affect people's lives. It's gonna affect people's lives. And so we already looked at verses one through seven the, qual the 15 qualification of the pastor, the elder, or the overseer. And now we'll look at the qualification of deacons. Now, as I looked at these qualifications of deacons and the encouragement uh, uh, that he gives women uh, in this chapter, it seemed to me as though women can serve alongside the men in this office of deacon. Uh, in other words, uh, uh, this word deacon carries the idea of being a servant or an assistant uh, to the pastor. And we all are called to, to serve in some capacity or another. So this could apply to all believers, but he uh, specifically to uh, the male leadership, but also women could serve alongside their husbands, uh, but also women could serve uh, as servants or assistants uh, to the elder, to the pastor in a local assembly. And so we're going to see the qualification of deacons. And so start, let's read our text, verse 8 through 13. Deacons likewise must be men of dignity not double tongue, 
And the reason, if I saw this word men here, and see that could apply to men and women, uh, because in verse one of chapter three, uh, when it comes down to the office of pastor, uh, Paul was very specific. He said it is a trustworthy statement in verse one and three, if any man. But yet, when he come down to deacon, he says, if any, if, uh, um, likewise must men. So he used uh, men, uh, uh, plural here, and, and it may indicate that women could serve in this uh, uh, capacity. Um, under male under male leadership. Uh, now, Paul continued his instruction here, uh, and we'll read: Deacon likewise must be men of uh, dignity, not double tongue or addicted to much wine, or fond of sordid game, but holding to the mystery of faith with a clear conscience. These men must also be tested. Then let them serve as deacons if they are beyond reproach. Women must likewise be dignified, not malicious, malicious gossips, but temperate, faithful in all things. Deacons must be husbands of only one wife and good managers of their children in their own household. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a high standing and great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. So here Paul continued his instruction to this young uh, pastor, Timothy, concerning order in the life of the local church. And he set forth here qualification for deacons. So the deacons are like assistants to the pastor elder. The pastor elder need to be spirit controlled but he also needs spirit control leadership assisting him. This is why Paul gives this instruction to ensure that the pastor elder overseer would have spirit control leadership assisting him and aiding him in his responsibility. So deacons are the elder, uh, the, uh, the deacon and the elder are to be the same as it relates to their character but in function, they are different. So what is the type of person that qualifies to be a deacon? So here's the qualification to be a deacon. Verse one, uh, verse eight, I mean, verse eight, deacons likewise. Now the word likewise uh, describes an office that is different from that of the elder overseer. It is the office of deacon. So the office of deacon is different in function, but in character, the deacon is to be spirit controlled and be a man of character and maturity. Now the word here, the Greek word deacon is uh, dikonos, and it means servant, D-I-A-K-O-N-O-S, and it means servant. Now a servant have no will of his own. A servant lived to carry out the will of another. To function as a, the deacon was to function as a go-between agent to the pastor elder to assist in his responsibility. The servant does not sell, uh, serve self-interest. He reflects Christ's attitude in Matthew 20, 28, go to Matthew 20, 28, tells us that Jesus came not to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. So the deacon is a servant. He is a go-between person who assists the pastor in serving others and meeting other needs. Matthew 20, 28. Matthew 20, 28 reads. Actually, let's read, let's start at verse 20, uh, 24. And here the, the 10 became indignant with the two brothers. Uh, but Jesus called them to himself and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentile lorded over them and their great men exercise authority over them. 
It is not this way among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. Now, you guys know the, the story here that the mother of uh, uh, John uh, came to Jesus and asked him for positions and, and, and wanted to be great amongst all the other um, the, the disciples. But according to the word of God, those who are great within the a local assembly is those who serve. Those who serve others, those who do not have self-interest in the local assembly, but have the interest of other at the forefront front. And so that is where this word comes from. It comes from uh, uh, this word for servant. And now let's go back and look at the qualifications now. Now that we see that the deacon is to function as a servant, a go-between person, a person uh, who is a intermediate, uh, how you say it, a mediator. In other words, somebody who mediate between uh, those part of the local assembly and the pastor. So he is there to serve uh, the congregation as a servant, uh, assisting uh, the pastor in his God-given responsibility. All right, uh, and now we go back. So the first uh, qualification is he must be men of dignity. Now, dignity here means someone who is worthy of respect. Someone who is worthy of respect. And they all see, we have to win our right to be respected. And our character to show that, that we don't take our office lightly, that we're serious about what God have called us to. And it shows our seriousness through our conduct. And our conduct show that we are worthy of respect. So the deacons are to be worthy of respect. Two, not double tongue, not double tongue. Now this word carries the idea of a tail barrier or a gossiper. And it could mean someone who is consistent in what they say. A deacon is to be someone who is consistent in what they say. Not saying one thing, but then thinking another or doing something else behind closed doors. Saying one thing to one person, but another thing to somebody else. This person is two-faced, but a deacon is not to be two-faced. Saying one thing and living one way part of the time and another way at another time. This man who is not a double tongue is a man who is honest even when no one is looking. He's not hypocritical. He don't stage play. And stage play is when somebody pretend. But he's sincere and a man of integrity and a man who is honest. And then three, third pro uh, qualification, and addicted to much wine. He is not addicted to too much wine. In other words, he's not prone to drink too much wine, or a, he's not a man who mind is controlled habitually by wine. See, a man who is controlled habitually by wine don't think rationally, don't have control of his life. This is a person who habitually do not drink or be controlled by strong drink, which is a command in Ephesians 518, be not drunk with wine, but be controlled or influenced by the Holy Spirit. So you see, a deacon must be a man who is, uh, a person who is spirit controlled. And then four, are fun or sordid gain. Sordid gain carries the idea of greed. So a deacon is not to be a person who is greedy for money. Uh, this man do not make money Nothing wrong with money in itself, but 
the deacon, uh, the one qualified as a deacon, he don't make money the prime object of his life. Instead, the prime object of his life, how can I glorify God? How can I glorify God? That is my priority in life. And then five, it's saying verse nine, but holding to the mystery of the faith. A mystery is something that was hidden in the past, but now have been revealed in the present. So he holds to the mystery of the faith with a clear country. In other words, a man who lives in harmony with what God has revealed to him about his plan in the word of God. So a deacon is someone who don't believe one thing, but yet practice another thing. So a deacon is uh, 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 the person who's qualified to be a deacon. His lifestyle is in harmony with his beliefs. So the doctrine that we believe as Christians is the rule of his life. He practice what he preach. Or he take all the principle that God revealed to him from the word of God and he used it in his life. And then six, 10, these men will also first be tested. In other words, they have to pass the test of time, then let them serve as deacons if they are beyond reproach. That's what passing the test of time means. In other words, the deacon must also have no observable flaw, reasonable, reasonable observable flaw, because people can see flaws in you and it may not be uh, 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 reasonable. It may just be jealousy or prejudice or something like that. But he is to be beyond reproach or blameless. In other words, there is no observable flaw in his lifestyle either. In the past or even in the present. But then he turned and interrupt uh, these qualifications before he resumed these qualifications of deacon. So we know he's been talking about men in verse uh, uh, 8 through uh 10, but then he say women must likewise. So women has a uh, another uh, a function, not the same as men, but in a sense it is because they too are called to be servants of the local assembly and not here to serve their own interests. Every woman in the local church is here to serve one another. Verse 11 say women must likewise be dignified. Now, does this verse teach that there are female deacons? Well, a lot of people historically have said that this is uh, wives of deacons. And some believe that these are unmarried women who assist the deacons. But it's very hard to decide. We know that who he's speaking to about in verse 8 and 10 is different from who he's speaking about in verse 11. So we conclude that in verse 8 through 10, he's speaking about men, but then he's talking about women in verse 11. And so women are not being excluded from this service. And, 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 and so uh, because in uh, Romans 16, 1, Phoebe is said to be a deaconess. So she, the same word that is used for deacon is used for Phoebe in Romans 16, 1. Go to Romans 16, 1. What tells us that a woman also can serve as a servant of the church, a go-to, go-between person in the local, uh, local assembly, assisting the pastor in serving the body. Uh, 16, uh, 16, 1, Romans 16, 1.
I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a servant of the church, which is at Sikri. So servant here is the same word for deacon. It's the same Greek word for deacon, what tells her there were women serving in the church. So this could mean that she was simply a servant of the church, but she could be serving in an office of deaconess in her local assembly. But these women too, who are serving in the local assembly as deaconess must be women who are controlled by the Holy Spirit as well. Because he gives some qualification for them. If you go back to three, uh, 1 Timothy 3, so here's the qualification for those women seeking to serve within the local assembly. First, they must be worthy of respect. They must be dignified, worthy of respect. They have won their right to be respected through their lifestyle. They are second, they're not malicious gossip. And see, a gossiper is someone who slanders, someone who slanders others. So a deacon is, is not to be a gossiper, is someone who slander or assassinate the character of others because it demonstrates that they're not serving themselves, but they're exalting themselves over the, the person that they are slandering. And what they slander may be true, but it's none of your business. <laughs> Stay in fellowship. And then they're to be temperate, but temperate. Temperate here means they must be well-balanced and have self-control and not be controlled by emotions, but think your way through problems and be well-balanced. And then four, faithful in all things. Faithful in all things, meaning they are committed and trustworthy. You can trust them to do what they say and say what they mean and be there when you need them. They are faithful in all things. They're committed and trustworthy. So that's the qualification for the deaconess or the servant woman. And then 12, in verse 12, let's go to verse 12 now. Now he's gonna turn back to men. Deacon must be husband of only one wife. In other words, a deacon, too, must be a one, I always get this wrong, I, I say a one-man woman, but, but a, a one-woman man. So deacon must be a one-woman man. And then he must be one of good managers of their children and their own household. He must be able to manage his children and his own household if he's entrusted with the affairs of the local assembly. Now, I noticed that Paul did not uh, uh, say nothing about the duties of de deacons, which indicate that he did not associate specific tasks with the office of deacons. He seemed to have intended that the deaconship function as official servants of the church in whatever capacity the elders may seem that there's a need for within the local assembly. So they were in effect, they were the elders assistants. So 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 13, gives us a twofold pattern for ministry in the church or official ministry in the church. The ministry of one, Episcopos, oversight, elder, and that of service, dekonos, that of servant. The elder's office arose out of the Jewish religious life, where the deacon office seemed to have developed from an incident that we saw, we see in Acts 6, 1 through 6. So here's where the office of deacon arose that. Go to Acts 6, 
verse one through six. This is where we get this office of deacon from. Acts six, one through six. Verse one through six. Now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews. So these were Jews from the dispersion who were in Jerusalem to celebrate the festival of Passover. Against the native Hebrews, because their widows were being overlooked in the David's serving of food. So during the communion service, the uh, native Jewish believers were neglecting the Jews who had been dispersed throughout the Greek world. And verse 2 says, so the 12 summoned the congregation of the disciple and said, it is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. So notice here the qualification of deacons, of servants. They were to manifest in their character maturity. See, good, having a good reputation amongst unbelievers and also among believers demonstrates spiritual maturity. And spiritual maturity is only, net, only possible when a believer is controlled by the spirit instead of his flesh for long periods of time. And he only can have wisdom if he is saturating his soul and his mind with the word and applying it to life. So they had to be people who are mature. Verse four, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So here we see Luke did not call the men appointed to assist the apostles but he wanted them to assist the elders who serve, especially in the realm of physical and material needs. So they wasn't selected to assist the apostles. They were selected to assist the elders of the churches to assist in the physical and material needs. Well, I have a need, and my need, I mean, I, I see a need within our local assembly. And one of the needs are, and I see is a really big problem in our local assembly, is that when you see people are not at church, find out what's going on. I can't do everything. <laughs> so if you see people that you normally see in church and you have their phone number, call them, check on them and see how they're doing. You never know what they may be going through. That is what we're called to do. And if you know of someone that have a need, communicate that. I don't know everything. And so here we see that in a local church, we all are to function together for the benefit of others, following the example of our Lord Jesus Christ, who said in Philippians 2, let us, let's go there. Let me, let me make sure I don't misquote it. Go to Philippians 2. And, 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 and this is what we are called to do. I want to share uh, something with you after we read this because uh, I have got some really disturbing news. Often I do. Where... An individual feel like they have no place in our community because they feel like no one is concerned about what they are going through. 
But this reminds me of Philippians 2. But we have to all keep our antennas up because we never know what our brothers and sisters are going through. Philippians 2, verse uh, 3 through 5, 3 through 5. Philippians 2, 3 through 5. Philippians 2, 3 through 5. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude of this thinking in yourself, which also was in Christ Jesus. So here we are told to imitate or to copy our Lord Jesus Christ. And how do we copy our Lord Jesus Christ is keep our antennas up when there is a physical and material need or a spiritual need within the local assembly. When people go missing, we need to go call them <laughs> or go visit them. And that is what the deacons did in assisting, it, assisting the pastor. That was one of the things they did. Now, what is the reward? What is the reward? Of functioning as a deacon, and we'll close with this. Go to, go to uh, back to uh, First Timothy three. What is the reward of serving as a deacon? What is the reward? Let's go see. Verse thirteen. First Timothy 1, uh, I mean 3, verse uh, 13 say, For those who have served well as deacon obtain for themselves a high standing and great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. There's two rewards. One, a good reputation. A good reputation. And see, we are called to have a good reputation amongst outsiders. And see, when people see us serving as servants, that's going to give us a good reputation. Not just with men, but with God. And maybe God will brag about you and I as he did with Job when he say, when, when he told Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there's no one like him on the earth, an upright man that fear God and turn away from evil. Good reputation. And then second, confidence before God. And see, when I have confidence before God, then I have confidence for circumstances. I have confidence toward people. I don't fear anything when I have confidence in God. See, when we're living an exemplary life, why should we fear? Why should we fear? I have complete confidence when my lifestyle reflects integrity. When I am walking in spiritual maturity, I have confidence. I may have trials and adversity, but I have confidence before God because I'm living as a servant. And not only that, I have confidence before people. And the Bible said that when a man ways please the Lord, he make even his enemies at peace with him. That's how you make an enemy a friend. So you make an enemy a friend by being a servant. That's how you make an enemy a friend. Let me close with Philippians. Uh, uh, not Philippians. Uh, let me close with 1 John. 1 John. 1 John chapter uh, 3. First John chapter 3, verse 16 through 22. 16 say, we know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we all, we are obligated. That word all mean obligated. We are obligated to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? You think we're going to have a good reputation when, when believers within the local assembly have spiritual and physical need and 
And when they share our their needs with us, we just say, you know what? I'm just going to pray for you. Instead of seeing how we can help that brother. 18 say, little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and in truth. We will know by this that we are of true and will assure our heart before him. And whatever our heart condemns us, for God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandment, do those things that are pleasing in sight. See, my heart don't condemn me when I'm living as a servant. But when I'm not living like a servant or I'm living a selfish life, then my heart condemns me. And I don't have confidence before God. I live in fear. But when I'm walking in fellowship, being controlled by the spirit, walking as a servant, I walk in my life with complete confidence that whatever I ask God in prayer, he will do it in faith. Let us start right here. Father, we're just so grateful uh, for the privilege that we have to serve within this local assembly. We pray, Father, that our life will be uh, in such a way that others will be drawn to Christ and see your love. We thank you for the privilege we have to serve you and, and give up everything for your glory because you gave up everything for us. Bless our time as we go out into this world. We ask that you will give us everything that we need to live exemplary lives so that we can win the loss to Christ and build believers up to spiritual maturity. Help us keep our antennas up for spiritual and material need and function as servants who do not live for ourselves, but for you and for others' benefit. Keep our minds and hearts until we meet again. In Christ's name, amen.